And the, the script I'm going to be working on is in the lab two subfolder, which, you know, if you, if you've downloaded all the ones that are accessible there, or you could go back and get this one. I, I don't think I changed it. I changed it a tiny bit today, but you'll get the idea when we run it. So what you're seeing in the bottom right corner is the contents of the uh, lab two subfolder. And so a bunch of stuff, uh, two-way ANOVA, which I think we did last week, and a few things that we'll look at next week. And down here, what I'm going to be doing today is log linear regression. So what I'll do is run the whole thing, show you what comes out, and then we'll go back briefly so I can show you exactly where you can tweak things to get your data in there. So I'll select it all. And I say a quiet, yes. I just, I, I changed the order of a few commands here, but you can always go back to the same folder. And what, what I suggest actually in general is when you tweak something, um, download, and you've got the downloaded version, immediately save as and like add your name to the front or whatever. So you've still got mine. But um, yeah, I would, after I do something, use something in class, I would always re download it then. Because I, I just, when I'm trying things out, like the night before or whatever, then I often do some tweaks to it. Nothing substantive, but you might as well get the latest when you do it. Uh, okay, so I selected everything, and you know my favorite expression. Let's just run it and see what happens. And this one, like like many of the scripts, actually generates more than one plot. So I'll go back, you know, the, in the plotting pane, this bottom right corner, the plots kind of pile up. So I'll just go back to the first one and talk about them a bit. Now we're getting in, internet instability. Okay. All right. So, um, this data set, I'm, I'm going to kind of follow along in the top left as I do it. So we're looking at this first plot, and it's showing you um, a plot of all these car manufacturers that are in this data set, this part of the data set that I'm using, and um, the number of cars in the data set for that manufacturer that are classified as compacts versus SUVs. And this is just to give you a notion of the nature of the data before we get into the actual analysis. So to looking over at the script, again, it, there's something unrelated to categorical data analysis that may be a useful tool for you to have. And that's um, a part packages, which everybody's dealt with already, um, often consists of a combination of scripts that somebody's written, but they also have data sets sometimes in them with them. And th this uh, tidyverse that we're loading in line two here is an example of that. They have this uh, car data set, MPG, that has a bunch of data. And I'll try to find MPG. Do this in a sec. There we go. So just to take a look at the data set for a sec, 234 lines, and it's got the manufacturer, the model of the car, the displacement, that's the size of the engine. 
and I, I think that's in liters. I don't know much about cars, but I think it's in liters. The year of the car, this is fairly old data, obviously. The number of cylinders, the transmission. Um, I don't know what DRV is. Somebody, a car person might know that. It's got four gears or forward and reverse. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, CTY is city mileage. So the number of miles per gallon in the city. Highway, HY, HWY is highway mileage. And then um, I'm forgetting what FL is. <laughs> Might be able to figure that out after we don't use it in this example. And then class of the car, and you see compact and midsize and SUV and two seaters and minivans and all this stuff. So that's that's the data set that comes with the package. And then for the what we're doing, we want to pick out two of the groups because and this is a handy technique for you to know for looking at your data or research data or whatever. So notice that um, I've attached this MPG data set. That means I can refer to variables in the data set without, remember we use the that syntax of MPG dollar sign and then class. So the name of the data set dollar sign and then the name of the variable. If you say attach and the data set, like I've got in line nine there, then I can just refer to names in the data set. It'll know I'm talking about MPG. So I'm going to create, I create in line, oh shit, sorry. <laughs> I just dragged something I didn't need to. So in line 10, I create a sub data set called GR underscore compact, which I define as MPG left square bracket which mpg dollar sign class equals double equal sign compact in bracket in quote marks and then there's a comma and then another square bracket so that's a fancy way of saying i want to pull out a sub set of the data set of just compact cars so if I just type that down below here in the console, gr underscore compact, it prints out a bunch of data, the first few lines of the data set, which is just the compact cards. So I create that data set, then I create another data set, gr underscore SUV, which does the same thing, but picks out all the SUVs. And then I bring them together. So I, I've done this to basically create a subset of the data set, which is called two groups in line 12. And that's just a way of, of merging or adding together these two data sets. So I end up with a data set called two groups, which is just 109 observations. And I'll put that up here so you see it. And notice as I sweep down, we've got compacts, compacts, all compacts, and then SUVs, and that's all. So those few lines are a good way, you know, Omar, if you only want to look at a couple of lakes, then you just select out those two lakes, for example, in, in the same kind of fashion. So it's just a, a data management technique. I'm just using it here because it's simpler Conceptually, if you're doing log linear kind of analyses the first time, I just wanted a response variable that just had two categories. It's possible to have five categories or whatever, but for this example, I just wanted to create this simpler data set. It's got two categories of the categorical response variable, SUV and compact, okay? The next thing I do is make the class variable something called, so the class is whether it's compact or SUV, I call it a factor and that's just preparing it. it it's possible to do the kind of analysis we're doing without this translation of the class variable into 
into uh, what's called a factor, but it just makes the analysis and the output from it uh, just make more sense. So whatever variable, I guess the short version of this is whatever variable you're going to use for a categorical response variable, my suggestion is if it's not two categories now, pick out two categories, just like I've picked out the SUV and the compact here for this log linear analysis, and then do what I've done here to that categorical response variable and, and make it a factor. Okay, so the, the, the real analysis Sorry, what I should have said before then, looking at the plot, now that we have the data set, is this is the observed data. So you've got every, well, some of the observed data. You've got um, every manufacturer that's there from Audi to Chev to Dodge to Ford. And you've got the number of compacts for those manufacturers in the data set, that's the first bar, and you've got the number of SUVs for the data set, that's the second bar. So you can tell from this that in this data set, and I'm not, this is not true of the manufacturer as a whole, but in this data set, um, all the Audis are compacts. There's no Audi SUV. And there's neighbors of mine who have Audi SUVs, so this is not all encompassing, obviously. I, I don't think at that time there were Audi SUVs, but at the time this data set was assembled. But so this gives you an idea of kind of what the data look like. And I strongly recommend you do this plot. You, you'll see the commands for it in a second when we look at them. It, give, it familiarizes you. It's kind of doing lab one to your data, if that makes any sense. You're getting to know the data. We're getting to know the fact that Subaru Actually, there's more SUVs in this data set than there are compacts from Subaru. Uh, there's no compact Land Rovers. What a shocker. Um, there's no Volkswagen SUVs. You know, so you're getting familiar with the, with the data set. Um, and then before we talk about the next plot, which is really weird looking, I want to look at the results of the analysis. So if we go back to the script, you can see all of these lines 19 to 24, they start with a hashtag, which that's what you use. And I strongly encourage you to use that as much as possible when you're tweaking your scripts. That's where you comment. That's where you remind yourself what the heck you were doing when you constructed this script. But the, the real business part of this is line 25. So that's where we're building this so-called logistic model. This is a categorical analysis. Um, Logistic.fit is just what I've call, I'm calling the results of this analysis. Remember, R is weird in that you do a plot or you do an analysis, you can actually put the results of making that plot or doing that analysis into a variable. So the variable that I'm going to put the results of the analysis into is called logistic.fit. And my definition or, or doing that analysis is GLM. That's for general linear model. And then the bracket and class is the name of the categorical response variable. And the there's a squiggle and then the Predictors are manufacturer, that's a categorical predictor variable, and city, CTY, which is city mileage. It's a quantitative predictor variable. So those two things are my predictors, and my response is the class of the vehicle, SUV versus compact. The other weird thing about this, which makes it different from like doing an ANOVA, is comma, family equals binomial. And this has to do with the variability within each of the cells because we're actually fitting a model with categorical data. Either it's an SUV or it's a compact. So rather than expecting that 
remember we expected a norm, normal distribution of residuals in the different groups if we were doing a, a t-test or an ANOVA. In this case, we expect binomial distribution of responses, SUV versus compact in each group. So that's telling it what our so-called error variation is here. The next thing I do is ask for a summary of the results. So that's this line that says summary logistic fit. And we'll look at the results lower down and then a couple of other equivalent ways to in fitting the same model or reporting on the same model, loglin underscore ANOVA, that's my, my name for the results from an ANOVA table based on the logistic dot fit that I did. Uh, the test, test that I wanted to do is chi-square because of what we were talking about, this analysis of deviance that we're doing. Then I report those results and then I calculate predicted values for every combination of the predictors. Just like you, you know, when we did, when you do the regression in lab two, you'll get the predicted values, the residuals plotted. So when you're doing yours, the, the main thing to remember when you're tweaking this so that you can analyze your data is where you put your categorical response variable. I've got class here. You're gonna have whatever the name of your categorical response variable is and where you put your a categorical predictor and quantitative predictor. The rest of it is generic. So, um, and then that's the analysis. So let's look at the results. Let's look at what the results of the analysis look like. Here. So this weird looking output in the lower left corner is the, um, the results of the analysis. And you've got at the top there, it says call GLM formula equals class squiggle manufacturer plus a city family equals binomial, blah, blah, blah. And you get a bunch of, what, it, what it's doing is it's fitting a model as to how, as I said, the manufacturer of the car and the city gas mileage affect whether or not it's an SUV or a compact. And the way that it does that is it's actually fitting a model where the response is the probability of the car being an SUV. So the car, the car is either an SUV or a compact. So that kind of amounts to fitting the chance of those two categories with a given manufacturer and a given city mileage. So what you're seeing on the this big long list of the manufacturers is how the chance of being an SUV is affected depending on the manufacturer. So it's individual effects of manufacturers. The bigger the number, the bigger the chance that it's an SUV. You know, that it's so it's it's really helping you describe the effects of each of the categories of manufacture on the chance of being a, an SUV. There's one manufacturer that's not listed there. And there's something called the intercept. This is very much like multiple regression. And so the intercept is for the manufacturer. It's just the way that they kind of report the results here. The intercept is for the, the manufacturer that's not mentioned, and that's Audi. So Audi has a value of 15.75 and all of the others are differentiated by, you know, you add what you see as their effect to that 15.75 to get their chance of being an SUV. What do I mean by that? Well, Audi's got the lowest chance at 15.75. Volkswagen is the next Lois, its effect would be 15.75 plus 3.2, so around uh, 19. And then the next smallest one, the next largest one, I should say, is I think Toyota. 
So Toyota's effect is 24.8 plus that intercept of 15. So that's like 49. So you're seeing a magnitude of each. There's a graphic way to show that that I'll show you in a sec. But this is just trying to, to look at individual categories and see what their effect is on the categorical response variable. The other thing you see in that list is the coefficient for city, CTY right at the end here. And you see minus 2.396. What does that mean? It means the, the bigger the city mileage is, the less the chance it's going to be an SUV. And thank God, there's something here that actually makes practical sense. Yes, if, if my city mileage is higher, this probably isn't an SUV. So that, that kind of jives with my common sense um, understanding of the, of the data set. And that gets to the plot that you have over here. So what you're looking at in the plot is on the y-axis, the chance of being an SUV. And on the x-axis is the city mileage. And you're seeing the actual, the predicted value for uh, different manufacturers here and their city mileage. And look at the chance of being an SUV if your mileage is less than 15 is pretty high. So the, the relationship you're seeing is sort of like reverse sigmoid. It's like this, and then it drops to there. And so really what it's doing, think about this look, kind of like a toxicity test. What's the value, you know, as city mileage is going up, what's kind of the break point where we stop seeing the chance of being an SUV is dropping? So that's what that's, that's showing along with the actual data. There's different colors for each of the manufacturers, but that's getting beyond uh, what I can interpret with my color vision. Um, so if we go back to the sort of summary of the results, sort of a NOVA tab table style, but remember an analysis of deviance, as it says on the top there, we've got the effective manufacturer here, um, again, judge with a chi-square value, exa exactly the same thing going on under the hood in this analysis as for those simpler ones we looked at earlier. So we've got a strongly a strong effect of manufacturer and a strong effect of, of uh, city mileage, both on the chance of being an SUV. So if we look at the other plots that I have to illustrate it, and again, with the plots that are in the, the script, you can substitute your values, the values that you have pertinent to your, um, your data set here. So here we've got probability of being an SUV versus city miles per gallon. Here, just for to illustrate, this is like uh, the compact, the categorical response variable on the x-axis and comparing city mileage between them, you know, again, this is kind of a way to present the data that makes sense for people who, you know, you don't really want to have to wrap people's heads around log linear analysis just to give your, you're interested in the result. So you're interested in saying, yeah, look at this difference between compact cars, all else being equal, forget about manufacturer, between compact car city mileage and SUV city mileage, SUV, the median is like 12 or so. I don't know what that is in um, liters per 100K, which is what we use. But so you've got 12 miles per gallon for SUVs in the city. You've got something resembling 20. And this, these are US gallons. So they'd be um, equivalent to four liters. Um, but anyway, you can see the difference there. That That's a way that I would show the partial effect of the quantitative variable. And then this is showing kind of, in a sense, the relationship between your two predictors. So with, and keep in mind, this is just for the data set that we have here. 
where you've got the, the manufacturers along the x-axis, the 10 or 12 manufacturers, and you have their city uh, mile, mileage on the, on the y-axis. So you can see there the, the variation among them, the fact that the Land Rover is, you know, among the, I think among the lowest, if not the lowest Land Rover and the Lincoln. But notice there's no, um, there's no uh, uh, SUV versus compact. There's no class in here. So again, different kind of information. And, and all I tried to illustrate with these plots is again, getting your reader, if, if I'm writing a paper about this, getting your reader familiar with the data set, complementary to the analysis that you've done that, that's showing, yes, manufacture is important in predicting whether or not it's an SUV or a compact, and city mileage is also important. These are just ways to help illustrate that point. And going, just going back to that first plot that I had, this is really getting to the point of, you know, what's underneath that manufacturer effect on uh, on whether or not the car is a SUV or a compact. And notice, remember, Audi was the, the one that had the lowest chance of being an SUV. And there's 15 compacts that were Audis. There's zero SUVs. Volkswagen was a little bit higher chance, but not much. And the only reason it's slightly higher is there's only 13 or 14 Volkswagen compacts and zero SUVs. Uh, the, the next one in line, um, they all have, all the rest have SUVs, but it would probably be the one that's got both. So it's probably Toyota, which has both, but it's got more compacts than SUVs. And then the next one is uh, probably Subaru, which has more SUVs than compacts, but quite a few compacts. And then Nissan has both, but so, you know, it's, it's take what the analysis is doing is taking that, that's what's behind those coefficients that we saw for each manufacturer, the order that they had in their effect on the chance of being an SUV. That's the kind of deconstruction to do when you, again, you plug in your categorical response variable into a log linear analysis like this. And it's kind of why, and, and I'm not pushing it if it, do, if it doesn't make sense for your research context, but it's why I always think of it as, you know, I can think of situations in what I do in, in the real world outside of the course where, yeah, a log linear analysis would actually um, help me understand the system I'm looking at more. So it, you know, once, once you do this and apply it to your example data set, you might come up with some ideas like that. So that's, uh, that's my story on it. And uh, it's, it, it is really weird not seeing myself, even myself on here. But um, anybody have any questions they want to bring out about that? Yeah, Flavia. Yeah, it's the same, uh, we'll go to it. No, it's okay. Um, because it it's, you'll see it also in the context of doing like ANOVAs and stuff like that. It It's, it's how they, it's the usual syntax for the model. So you've got the response variable or variables on the left side of the squiggle and then the predictor variables on the right side. So in this case, in line uh, 12, you've got class as a function of, or as predicted by manufacturer and city. And um, the one thing that I did do, and I'll just try it now and see if I blow this up, is um, put an interaction between them in here. You might not like it, but we'll try it. Let me just try to run that again. See if it works. Maybe. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, I talked a lot about how you interpret two-way ANOVAs last week and mentioned that in, um, remember in multiple regression, you know, or what people call ANCOVA, remember when we had that apartment and the years since highest degree both together as predictors of faculty salaries at Western. Um, and you can always, in those situations, you can have an interaction where the effect of one of the predictors depends on the other. So what you see, and I, I modified the analysis and I'll, I'll save this so that you'll get this version, I guess, since it worked. And you see in the analysis of deviance now, you've got the effect of manufacturer, the effect of city gas mileage, both highly significant, and then interaction between them. So that's saying, did, did the effect of gas mileage depend on which manufacturer you looked at? And things are a little challenging here because we've got obviously quite an unbalanced design, uh, unbalanced in the sense that think about um, uh, both Volkswagen and Audi, we don't know the effect of city gas mileage specific to Audi because there's none none of the SUVs there. So there's there's some unbalancedness in the data set, but what this is telling us is we don't really have good evidence that the combination of like the effect of city gas mileage depends on which manufacturer you look at. If I was doing this for real, what I would probably do is only look at manufacturers who produced both, right? And that that would be kind of a fair comparison because this analysis is being a little bit, it's a little bit weird because you've got uh, manufacturers like Audi and Land Rover that only do one or the other. It, and it makes it challenge. Just like when you're doing uh, your study or anybody's study where you have this combination of factors, but none of this combination of factors, it, it makes it very challenging. Forget about the stats challenges or whatever. It makes it challenging for you to make conclusions about how they work together because you're missing combinations of them that comes out in multiple regression when you have you know that that's why people worry about correlated predictors right if two of your quantitative predictors are highly correlated which in some cases they probably will be then you can't disentangle their effects on the response variable because you never see them you know you never see a high value of this one with a low value of that one if they're positively correlated with each other Okay. Anything else from people? Okay. So um, have a go at that if you get a chance by next week and let me know if you get stuck with it. And next week, just prior to reading week, we're going to confront the, uh, the double headed monster. By the way, my kids always love this. They have, you know, the, the plastic dragons with two heads. I always think of that dragon when we have next week's lecture. I, I should have a picture of them. They call them Sammy and Bammy. Two different, but anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, we'll talk about the, the double-headed monster of um, assumptions, what to do. You know, all the methods we talk about have assumptions behind them. What you do when those assumptions are not um, sufficiently satisfied in your judgment and then uh power so you know that age old it's so cool to go to a conference and you know some some person illustrious person gives a talk you put your hand up at the end say but you know what was your power and they'll freeze on the spot and melt so you learn all about that what what it means and why it's important especially when you're designing your study 